When I was compiling quotes for a series of healthcare articles that we ran in Freedom Daily, most of those quotes came from articles that had appeared in the Freeman magazine published in the 1950s. And in those articles, the authors, uh, writing from a, a free market perspective, of course, were talking about the health care threat that was coming from the leftists, those that were trying to use government to take over the health care system, to manage and control this, this vitally important part of our lives. This was back in the 1950s. Again, the essays appeared in the 60s, then again in the 70s. So anyone that thinks that this assault is dead had better place things in perspective. The battle will continue. And we were fortunate to have Dr. Saz, a hero not only for libertarians, but also for those in the psychiatry profession, address us tonight on health care, the latest excuse for the Leviathan. Dr. Saz. Mr. Hornberger, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for this extremely generous introduction. It is my honor and my pleasure uh, to be here, and I thank you for asking me to perform this uh, service, this honor. Uh, I will forego the obligatory uh, humor at the beginning, uh, but not quite. Uh, much of what I will say is actually uh, will illustrate uh, a remark that Will Rogers made. Will Rogers said, I don't have to uh, make any jokes every time Congress passes a law, it's a joke. <laughs> and uh, some of the things which I will be mentioning to you will be the kind of legislation that, to which this applies. Also, I might say that after having the pleasure of hearing Joe Sobrand's address at lunch, it occurred to me to say, uh, with all modesty, uh, that this is really a footnote. What I'm going to tell you is a footnote to the general theme uh, that he has outlined and which has uh, also intrigued me, that really we don't have the kind of constitutional government that the founders dreamed of, but instead we have a different kind of government. And in some ways, what kind of government we have is what I'll be talking about. Now, this, this year also happens to be uh, the 50th anniversary of the publication of Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. And it seemed to me that, that I would uh, uh, get started with that uh, uh, watershed. And between uh, the publication of that book and the uh, unraveling of the Soviet Union, we have now come to a situation where, which was in some ways always true in this country, but it is now uh, quite obvious that uh, no respectable individual defends socialism or communism as an effective economic policy. No one will say, as uh, whoever it was, Brezhnev, that you, we will overtake you. We will have a better, consu better consumer economy than you do. No one says that. But in point of fact, in the United States, going quite far back for reasons which are historical and cultural and uh, perhaps unknown, unknowable, the word socialism has early acquired a negative connotation. So there are very few people who call themselves socialists, much less communists. But they don't have to. Because in this country, the notion of protection, particularly protection from destitution and disease, has really replaced the need for socialism. And as I see it, really, the whole health care rhetoric is socialist rhetoric in terms of disease treatment and so forth. Now, I'll be obviously saying much more about that. Now, when we talk about the government taking a role in protecting people from disease, the first thing I want to mention that the very concept of disease is not as simple as it may seem. And its meaning has changed. Now, what is a disease? You might all think you know what a disease is. And of course you do. But you don't. <laughs> uh, 
because uh, those of you uh, who think of this in a kind of a personal and down-to-earth way, mainly about yourself, will think that a disease is something, first of all, that you don't want. You rather have without, be without. Secondly, that it is something that happens to you. Something like leukemia, or diabetes, or, or arthritis. I mean, this is not something that, that you want. Uh, and fourthly, it is something which one can genuinely, philosophically say is not a part of you. In other words, if you have, let's say, tuberculosis or you have a sore throat, uh, now, or for this week, next week, when you haven't got it, you will still be you. It's not a part of you. Now, this is in some ways, the last but not least, there is a scientific dimension of it, uh, which is very important, and uh, which again, you don't have to be a, a physician or, or uh, in any way a professional person to realize that modern medicine is relatively recent, going really only back to about uh, the middle, the second half of the 19th century, and depends really on the development of modern medical technology, mainly uh, the autopsy, uh, tissue staining, pathology, and then the more sophisticated techniques of examining the body. So that uh, I have always thought uh, that the analogy between the gold standard in economic affairs and pathological lesions in medicine make a very nice analogy. That is, diseases are not something that doctors make up. It is something that they find, and they typically found it, in dead bodies. And how do you know that somebody has a disease, that somebody dies, and the, the pathologists examine the liver, the kidney, the lungs, and so on, and they find if someone has pulmonary tuberculosis, that their lung looks different from a normal lung, and so on. It's that simple. And sometimes, of course, there are new diseases, like, like uh, AIDS, legionnaires, and so on. But these are all found by pathologists on people who are, quote, sick in some ways. But the clinical diagnosis is always secondary is always trumped by the pathological diagnosis, as it said in medicine. Now, this was pretty much the case until, certainly even when I went to medical school, which was more than 50 years ago. But this has changed, uh, really, since then, quite, ra quite rapidly. This was, first of all, not always true. And I, as I said, I'm not going to be saying much. This was never true of psychiatry, because psychiatrists always were the medical specialists who treated diseases which did not exist in the sense that pathologists never saw them. Pathologists, going back to psychiatry, pathologists never saw madness. They had pathologists in mental hospitals, they kept looking for diseases. And every once in a while they did find the diseases historically, the most important example being neurosyphilis. And neurosyphilis, as you know, is a pretty bad thing. Uh, and if you have neurosyphilis, uh, after a while you don't act normally, quote, so that causes madness. And then, of course, if pathologists found this, then this became, quotes a disease. Now, one of the things which happens, and I just want to get this out of the way, is that when a pathologist finds a disease, it's no longer a mental disease. Then it's a real disease. It's a brain disease. And neurosyphilis still exists. It's very rare now, after this of penicillin, but it's, it still exists. But psychiatrists have nothing to do with it. If somebody has neurosyphilis now, it's treated by neurologists or Specialists in infectious diseases with antibiotics. It's not a psychiatric disease. Now, the reason why this is important is because from a psychiatric basis, uh, with which you are more or less familiar, in our day we have developed to a point where diseases are no longer defined by pathologists, but, by de but are defined essentially by a political process. And I will illustrate that. Uh, as I go on, uh, of which, uh, generally speaking, diseases are things which are unwanted behaviors. Now, who are they unwanted by? They may be unwanted by the individual himself, in which case he or she may call it a disease, or they may be unwanted by psychiatrists or most, ty most typically by society, the authorities of the state. Of which the best example, of course, is quotes, drug abuse, substance abuse. Now, the important thing, uh, well, I'll come back to that. Now, one more thing about disease. The entire healthcare debate 
is premised on an idea which is a wonderful idea, a very simple idea. There's only one thing wrong with it. It is totally fallacious. Now let me tell you what that idea is, and I, have n I never see this mentioned. Again, it is something which when I tell you, you will say, well, of course. But I never see this mentioned, and it is absolutely crucial. Now the premise is that diseases require treatment. So the thing to do is avoid diseases so you don't need the treatment, which will then cost a lot of money to everybody, because obviously nobody pays for it anymore. You know, you, you pay for everybody else's disease except your own disease. So the thing to do is to prevent diseases. Sounds all right? No. Diseases don't require treatment. Diseases, that's why I define them, diseases are natural events, like oil in the ground. It's a phenomenon, cancer of the colon. Now, oil in the ground doesn't need extracting. People want it extracted, assuming they have some use for it. So diseases don't require treatment. Some people want their diseases treated. Okay? And some people don't want their diseases treated. Now you hear about how people shouldn't smoke, for example, and I'll come back to that, because it will cost a great deal of money to treat it. And therefore, if you get lung cancer, I will have to pay for it, so you shouldn't smoke. Now this has a certain rationale to it, given this socialist premise. There's only one thing wrong with it. There are all kinds of people with all kinds of diseases who don't want treatment. The relationship between disease and treatment is arbitrary. It's not logically if one, then the other. A lot of people with diseases want treatment. A lot of people without any diseases want treatment. It used to be called hypochondriasis. Conversely, a lot of people with diseases don't want treatment. Now, who are some of the people with diseases who don't want treatment? Well, there are two huge groups. I could spend maybe, you know, we are gaining an hour tonight, so maybe I should spend that extra hour uh, talking to you. Uh, but uh, one large group is are called Christian scientists. Now, when you hear about smokers being penalized for causing extra health care costs, do you ever hear about Christian scientists being exempted from certain taxes? Because they don't utilize health care costs at all. Right? You are a Christian scientist, you don't cost, it doesn't cost you anything. You taxpayer doesn't cost anything. Now, the other group, and I will perhaps say more about that, are so called crazy people. Now, they don't, their, their cost, their health care cost, is astronomical, as things now stand. But in point of fact, they have a characteristic. And that is, they don't want any treatment at all. I am talking about really mad people. When I talk about psychiatry, by the way, I should clarify it. I'm not talking about psychoanalysis, counseling. To me, psychiatry is one of two things, which, it, which is the way it was born and which is its backbone. It is locking up innocent people, called civil commitment, and excusing guilty people, called their insanity defense. That's what psychiatry is. In both cases, nowadays, generally, you get locked up. Keep in mind someone like Hinckley. Hinckley did not say, I was sick. Hinckley wanted to plead guilty. Other people said he is sick. <laughs> they are still treating him. They are working on his schizophrenia. Now, you see, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. But, <laughs> but nobody believes that. I think modern societies, especially this country, run on hypocrisy. Nobody believes any, any of this. Nobody believes that the war on drugs works and so on. But there are reasons why this goes on. Now, the other group of people are, quote, crazy people, who in current parlance, deeper goal parlance, suffer from denial. They are in denial. Now, what does that mean in denial? Denial means I don't want to see a doctor. Well, you would have thought this is a constitutional right. You don't have to see anybody you don't want to see. But no, if you don't want to see a doctor, then you certainly have to see a doctor. And that's, that's going to be very expensive. So there are... <laughs> So there are two ways in which healthcare costs are incurred, that you are asking for it, or that somebody else says you have to get some health care. And that's then going to cost money. Now, I prepared a fairly elaborate paper, but everybody tells me that I shouldn't read the paper. So I'm not going to do that, but I do have some quotes which I uh, do want to use. 
Now Mises uh, correctly uh, told us, and he was one of the first to really ride this point, it became one of his hobby horses it seems to me, that one cannot make rational economic calculations in a socialist economy. That's pretty obvious that, you know, how do you know what people want when they don't have it, they can't see, I don't want this kind of raincoat, I want that kind of button and so on, and somebody else tells you what there will be on the market. Now, if ever this was true of consumer goods, it seems to me that this is doubly true of medical services. Because there's absolutely no way of telling what kind of medical services the American people want. This, again, is so large a subject that I, I'm just going to do a very short shrift of it. First of all, an unknown number, an unknown percentage of people, but I think it's a very large percentage, now go to physicians for the simple reason of getting a prescription for a medicine. Because in point of fact, all drugs, virtually all drugs that any intelligent person wants and needs are illegal. All of them. The only drugs which are not illegal, completely illegal, are the so-called over-the-counter drugs. But every effective drug, for example, if you have a bad sore throat and if you have sinusitis, you want an antibiotic, that's illegal. If you have to go to a doctor to get a prescription, that to me is analogous to having to go in the old days to some Soviet bureaucrats and having to get a permission to leave the country. Now you could say you have a right to leave the country. Well, of course, if mama and papa give you permission to leave it. Now you have a, a, access to this drug pr provided you produce the right kind of symptoms. So you have to lie and say <laughs> what, what it is that you want. Now the best example of which is the disease, now here is a disease, which is probably one of the most frequently used, I mean, the, I understand the most frequent drug is uh, Zantec, is anti-acid drug, and so on. But in older days, and even now, these drugs are high on the list, is for a disease called insomnia. Now, it's one of the rules of medical licensure and medical practice in every state that a physician is not permitted to prescribe a drug, prescription drug for a patient, unless that patient is his personal patient, unless he has examined the patient, and therefore made a diagnosis that this is a drug required. Now, how does a person, how does a physician make a diagnosis of insomnia? Here is this busy, <laughs> here is this busy executive or housewife or whoever, who has an appointment for 2 p.m., Comes, comes at 1.45, already, you know, has to sacrifice all kinds of other things he wants to do in the physician's office. Maybe at 3.15 the physician will see him, by which time the physician is all worked up with a heavy schedule and the patient is all worked up. Now, how is the physician going to determine that this patient can't sleep? <laughs> then he goes home at 10 o'clock at night. It's a charade. But then, then you can get a prescription drug. Now, in the good old days, you could get barbiturates. Now, of course, you can no longer get barbiturates because barbiturates are very useful besides sleeping for one night, you can sleep forever. <laughs> and, that, and that you are not supposed to do. So, <laughs> so it's really quite impossible to, to make that calculation. Second, secondly, it's impossible to make the calculation because physicians themselves talk people into all kinds of medical procedures which are economically problematic, very complex, hard bypass, expensive things that you know, you have these statistics, how many of these things are performed so much more often here than in England or Canada or somewhere else. So in point of fact, to, again, this is for this audience, I mean, I'm carrying uh, in some ways calls to Newcastle, it's obvious that unless there was some other kind of arrangement, particularly complete access to drugs, and some very large measure of payment by patients, there would be no way of telling, there's no way of telling now how American citizens want to apportion their income into what, what is worth or how much is it worth when you're 80 years old to have some bone marrow transplant and this or that if you have to pay for it as compared to something else that you could do for your family and so on. But now that you don't have to pay for it, of course, this is a real seduction. I mean, go, go for it, because in some ways everybody feels, well, at least I can, you know, can sort of rip off the system. I can get all these things for nothing, all these treatments. 
Now, actually, let me quote you here something. Belatedly, pathologists, epidemiologists, real doctors, besides psychiatrists, are waking up to this. And here is a typical uh, comment from an article in the New York Times about the problem of what is it that's going on medically in the country and how you cannot tell what's going on. Belatedly, physicians complain, and I'm quoting now from this article, data from current medical records, insurance claim forms, and pharmacy records are severely biased and therefore all but unusable. Doctors may write in the record or an insurance claim form that they are doing a PSA test, that's a, a prostate cancer test, because a man has prostate cancer even when he is perfectly healthy. It is impossible to judge the outcomes of a clinical interaction on the basis of the paperwork that is now done. So when physicians, epidemiologists, pathologists will look back 50 years from now at records now, they will have absolutely no way of telling what was going on as compared to 100 years ago, or 80 years ago in terms of the incidence of syphilis or tuberculosis and so on. Now actually, all of what I have told you are just symptoms of a general phenomenon that has preoccupied me for pretty nearly uh, 40 years, or ever since I've thought of, you know, went to medical school, perhaps even before, and has of course occurred to other people too, and that is the therapeutization, the transformation of politics into healthcare in general terms. And I discovered a remarkably beautiful statement by the poet, who was of course much more than a poet, Winston Auden, who wrote the following. Now listen carefully because this really says it in a general way all and then I will elaborate on it. What is peculiar, and I'm quoting, what is peculiar and novel to our age is that the principal goal of politics in every advanced society is not, strictly speaking, political one, a political one, that is to say, it is not concerned with human beings as persons or citizens, but with human bodies. In all technologically advanced countries today, whatever political label they give themselves, their policies have essentially the same goal, to guarantee to every member of society as a psychophysical organism the right to physical and mental health. Now this is now sort of taken as an elementary quote right, that we have a right, and you know, the World Health Organization, the United Nations has this in its uh, platform and so on. Well, back now to, to what is health. Well, one or two of the things which are defined as disease now are what used to be called bad habits. Now, bad habits now, if they are medical, as I already indicated, are habits which cost, which may lead to disease and therefore cost the taxpayer money. Of which the two best exa two examples that I will use are smoking and obesity, overeating, whatever that is. But before I come to that, <coughs> I have to make a comment about how, how medical costs are now defrayed, paid for, because that's the infrastructure for the, for the problems. The problems are the solution. The solution is to have, quotes health insurance. Now, this whole thing, very much like psychiatry, one can't talk about, unless one talks, you know, excuse me, even though I do it with an accent, but one has to talk English about it. <laughs> now, health insurance is not health insurance. First of all, it's illness insurance. And secondly, it's not insurance at all. It's not insurance at all. Because insurance is something which a person buys for something, for an event, for a future event, from which he wants to protect himself. Like his house burning down. Okay? Therefore, a homeowner's insurance does not pay for fixing the plumbing, repainting the house, or changing the light bulb. Now, if you are on Medicare, like I am, you get a letter from the Medicare system, go and get your flu shot, it won't cost you anything. And so on. So the most trivial things are now paid for. That's not insurance. 
No, ins no insurance can do that. Secondly, how would you like, how would, how, what do you think would happen to the homeowner insurance industry if state legislatures compelled every such insurance company to insure homeowners for burning down their own house? <laughs> now, I kid you not. If you are in a group plan, the state legislatures many years ago have compelled insurance companies to insure on what they call on parity that you don't get schizophrenia. I don't know how many of you wake up, go to bed at night worrying that you'll wake up with schizophrenia. <laughs> or that you'll wake up from a disease called substance abuse called heroin addiction. Or even alcoholism. Is this something that you get? Or is this something that you do to yourself? <laughs> so this is why I said emphasize at the beginning. Now these are things you do to yourself. And I'll come back to the two things, being overweight and smoking. Now is it possible to be overweight unless you put more calories into your mouth than you use up? <laughs> I mean, how many, how many years of schooling do you need for this? Now if you have to actually do this act, how can this be a disease? <laughs> but wait until I, you see what I'm going to read to you from quotes. Now smoking is the same thing. How can you have smoking disease if you don't smoke? <laughs> By the way, all the psychiatric diseases, they are just more subtle. They are all in this class. Now you might say some people who have, I don't know, agoraphobia, who are afraid to get into an elevator, really don't want to get in, really would like to get into an elevator. To which my answer is yes and no. If they really wanted to, they would get into it. That's another lecture. <laughs> because in point of fact, I learned this, I was very, very young. Let me tell you a little autobiographical vignette. I, don't, I was read this in Hungary when I was very young. And again, maybe I remember it because it just uh, gelled with something. Because this was a very popular bo book in Europe, hardly known here. Uh, called The Story of San Michele by a physician named Axel Munte, a Swedish physician. And this was an autobiographical. Anybody has ever heard of this book? One person. M U N T H E. It's in a mass paperback in an English uh, translation, too. This was a man who lived, uh, uh, who was actually a contemporary of Charcot's, uh, who was at his height around, you know, Freud studied with Charcot in the 1880s, 1890s. And uh, there, were very, there was very little, uh, it might be worth going through this because this sort of gives you also an idea of what the distinction between medical disease and psychiatric disease is really in a very brutal kind of way. In the Nazi period, the same experiment sort of was repeated uh, that Bettelheim wrote about. But this is a story that Munte tells. Uh, in, let's say, 1890, there were large uh, madhouses, mental hospitals, so-called, insane asylums, in France, where Charcot in Paris and so on, where Charcot worked and where this uh, Axel Munte as a young physician was a young physician. And, uh, uh, you know, medical diagnosis was in, it in infancy. So if there was a, let's say, 30 year old, uh, typically very often these were women, who couldn't walk. Well, physicians had no, no very good way of finding out why this woman couldn't walk because either she didn't want to walk, so she didn't have to work uh, on some farm or something, in other words, quotes hysteria, what they then call, or couldn't walk because she had multiple sclerosis, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, in other words, some neurological disease which, which paralyzed her. There was no CAT scan, none of this thing, but there was a diagnostic test, absolutely foolproof test. There would be 30 patients, let's say, all of, none of whom could walk. And quite often in this uh, derelict building, at 2 o'clock in the morning, somebody was smoking or something, and the building caught on fire. And 15 patients ran out, paralyzed patients, <laughs> and were found on the lawn the next morning, you know, cavorting, and the 15 were incinerated. Well, that was a differential diagnosis. <laughs> so this, this sort of, you know, what does it mean that I can't and I don't want to? I mean, obviously, if if this can be overcome by this kind of a, an experiment of nature, then you have an answer. 
Now compare this to the current, one of the currently popular diseases, depression. Now I am not saying that depression doesn't exist. Obviously, a lot of people don't feel very happy. I mean, life is no bowl of cherries. <laughs> I mean, why, sh why should I? Why should anybody feel happy? Actually, if you go to museums and look at pre 18th 17th century pictures, they are all everybody supposed to be depressed. That was, you know, Mater Dolorosa. You know, that was in some ways the, the view of life. That life is a tragic experience, and people are sinful, and uh, do all kinds of things, and uh, they should suffer, and they should suffer in hell, and if you, are, if you were, were virtuous, maybe you'll be happy in a life hereafter. But this idea of keep smiling and everything is fine here was a very modern idea. <laughs> After all, you, you, your wife died every time she got pregnant, and you know, if you got sick, it was, you know, life was not very easy. Now, Parade magazine, on September 19, as I was writing this just a few weeks ago, uh, had, uh, on the previous week, it had a long cover article uh, with Tipper Gore about how depression is a disease that's treatable. And then uh, a week later, uh, there was a shorter piece in which this uh, message was repeated, and uh, the magazine reassured its readers, quotes, that you can find help for depression, and encouraged the reader to write to their depressed friends offering this sample letter form, dear blank X, I care about you and I am concerned that you are not yourself lately. I don't like to see you unhappy. I hear depression is an illness with very effective treatment. And two weeks later, in a depression screening reminder, Parade repeated its recommendation that people go for, quotes, depression screening. It's like cancer screening, which last year saved 1,500 persons from suicide. Now again, suicide is not exactly my topic for tonight. But you realize, if you have any sense of history at all, that we are talking about the renaming of what used to be sins, often mortal sins, as diseases. Suicide was self-murder up until the 19th century. Exactly like abortion, adultery, fornication, all kinds of things, homosexuality, masturbation. These were all sins. Now, they are all mental diseases or, mental or, or psychiatric treatments, if it's masturbation. Now, when I went to medical school, masturbation was still listed as the cause of schizophrenia. <laughs> but none of this somehow makes any difference. Now, depression cannot be a disease. And the fact that somebody can do something about it that makes you better doesn't mean that it's a disease. It simply means that you can be made to feel better by all kinds of things. Smoking, sex, winning the lottery, and so on. Okay, you know. Divorce. <laughs> uh. Now, one more point about how we pay for health care, which I forgot to mention when I mentioned the, the nonsense about insurance, first of all, which pays for trivial, which is not an insurance for catastrophic costs, but is, is some kind of a... A redistribu social redistribution scheme, a, social, a scheme of socialized medicine, uh, or redistribution of costs from one person to the other. Uh, the last thing, which of course is wrong with it, and uh, this also is beginning to dawn on people, although it's not articulated, and that is that there is no health care crisis, with any kind of proper use of English, in the sense that health care certainly for those who can afford it and who can make use of it intelligently, has never been as good as it now is in this country and in many other advanced countries for the simple reason why automobiles have never been as good and airplanes have never been as good and telephones have never been as good. I mean, it's obviously I don't have to belabor that. It's better now. We have all kinds of diagnostic and therapeutic tools. So period. So there's no crisis in that sense. I mean, and even poor people, as economists point out, not only do the poor person they live better now than the richest person did 300 years ago, but even a poor person, a penniless, homeless person who, goes to, uh, who has a bleeding peptic ulcer or a fractured leg who goes to Bellevue emergency room, gets better care than the King of England got 300 years ago. Again, because, well, it's obvious. Now, what, what is the crisis? Well, you're damn right there is a crisis. The crisis is that healthcare has become for entirely tax-related reasons, which all of you know much more about than I do, related to employment. 
Now, insofar as there is insecurity of employment, that's translated into insecurity of healthcare. So what's the answer? Why should healthcare be connected to employment? We want to go back to the old uh, company towns where the, where, the, uh, where the company gives you schools and uh, grocery stores and everything else, like in West Virginia 50 years ago. Why should it give you health insurance? This, this has become, of course, the West, this is in some ways the original German model. And again, this is sort of unquestionable. I mean, uh, and this was, what, as you know, the Clinton's uh, selling point. Don't worry, you don't have to pay for it. Your employer will pay for it. Well, it's like saying, don't worry about it. Your parents will pay for it. Now, where that money will come from, again, it's, it's lost in this economic stupefaction. So until that is, until healthcare is separated, health, so-called health insurance, from employment, I don't think we can talk any sense at all about healthcare. It's all nonsense. But to show you how, how inimical to American thinking the idea that one should not only pay for one's own health care, and you know, I don't have to remind this audience of that wonderful libertarian adage that people pay for what they value and value what they pay for. Well, this has been completely inverted, both in education, as Sheldon has so eloquently shown, and in health care. The idea is somehow that these are two things that are extremely important, but we shouldn't pay a penny for it. Now, somebody suggested, apropos of the abortion problem, that maybe this is something that should be paid for by private insurance. And I happened to come across one of our uh, leading uh, politicians' comment on this. And I will just first say what this person said, and then I will identify the person, unless you can identify this person yourself. The answer to this one quotes, we are totally opposed to women getting private insurance for their private parts. <laughs> I mean, if this isn't communist rhetoric, I don't know what is. What's wrong with private insurance for private parts or any other parts? <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was Congresswoman Patricia Schroeder. Now let's go back a little bit to the history. And let me read to you what our great benighted president Franklin Delano Roosevelt said about this, who really launched this uh, thing. Now actually the origin of this problem, and I describe this in my book, the, Our Right to Drugs, uh, and uh, there's a large literature on this. As I see it, the origin of this, as Milton Friedman pointed out, uh, the origin of this problem of the politicization of health goes back to medical licensure but even more, I would say, because medical licensure obviously is an indefensible kind of a restraint of trade, but even more to prescription drug laws. Prescription drug laws, I think, is the beginning of the end, in some ways, of freedom in this country, in that it is the leading wedge of telling the American people, you are too stupid to determine what to put into your own mouth. Now, if you are too stupid, then we'll tell you. And it begins with opium for Chinese immigrants, and it ends with cholesterol or wherever. Now let's see how this started, or sort of got its momentum. It was already in motion, but it was very languid. In 1940, one of the things which Roosevelt did, which is very little remembered perhaps, is that he dedicated the National Institutes of, Mel of Health, not far from here, in Bethesda, and at the dedication of the NIH, Roosevelt said the following, quotes. I should have read this first because it certainly sounds more like Hitler or Mussolini. We cannot be, we cannot be a strong nation unless we are a healthy nation. And so we must recruit not only men and materials, but also knowledge and science in the service of national strength. The ramparts we watch must be civilian in addition to military. End of quote. So like in Italy, Germany, and the Soviet Union, it was time for American medicine to cease serving the interest of the patient and begin to serve the interest of, quote, national strength. 23 years later, Kenneth Arrow, Nobel laureate in economics, declared, quote, it is general social consensus that the laissez-faire solution for medicine is intolerable. 
This year, in the prestigious Shattuck Lecture, Bernadine Healy, the former head of NIH, who recently resigned, hailed Roosevelt's medical patriotism and proudly proclaimed, quotes, in fulfilling its mission, the National Institute of Health is quintessentially political, but we hope it embodies politics at its best, the use of public resources and power for the public good. By seeking to intervene between our fellow creatures and their suffering or death, the National Institute of Health is our most authentic answer to the question of our humanity. There you got it. Not one word about doctors or patients or the doctor's duty to the patient or the patient as an individual. Now let me run through why there is no health crisis here in a technological sense, in, in, a, in a correct sense. The reason uh, uh, and why, why, there, uh, or, uh, why there is one, or why there isn't one. In other words, what we have is a, is a problem of cost increases. Now, why has the cost of healthcare increased? I have listed without explanation, they are pretty clear, seven reasons, which are usually not, some of these are usually not that clearly identified. Now, one is the most obvious one I alluded to already, is a development of sophisticated and costly diagnostic and therapeutic technologies. Well, obviously, if you have CAT scan, it costs, as against if you just have a stethoscope, it costs more. Second one is, the result of the success of medicine, there is an increasingly aging population beset by more and more and more incurable diseases. And this idea that you save money by curing a disease is complete nonsense, because a person will get, just get more diseases later. <laughs> the economically most effective thing is for somebody to smoke a lot and drop dead suddenly at age 50 of a coronary heart disease, and he won't collect his social security, he won't get any more diseases. He has lived, he has been productive, and he, then he's dead. So it won't cost any more. What would be even more effective if nobody gets bored, then there are no medical expenses at all. <laughs> so, so thirdly, and this I have emphasized, this is sort of my uh, hobby horse, is the medicalization, a terrible word, but it's, uh, it does the job, the medicalization of life that is categorizing more and more undesirable behaviors as diseases, and now be careful, more and more desired behaviors as treatments. Several people have asked me, well, if somebody has, for example, quotes, a chemical imbalance, doesn't it prove that that's a disease if they get better on Prozac? Well, a lot of people feel better after they smoke. Sigmund Freud was a leading example. Does that mean that they suffered from a nicotine deficiency until then? You have to get back to what is a disease. A disease is something that a pathologist finds in the body. Chemically, visually, in whatever way. It is not the organism's response to a chemical, which is subjective. I feel better. That's a very nice anecdote. It's very important. That's why people do whatever they do. Drink, eat, get married, get divorced, have children, and so on. Complain about children, there you go. So, it all makes you feel better and worse. Every uh, thing is that life, until you die, every solution is a new problem. Think about it. Every solution is a new problem. La say, fourthly, the transformation of the physician's role from ministering to the medical welfare of his patient to servicing healthcare consumers. Fifthly, the creation of a vast so-called health insurance industry. Sixth, the persistence of the illusion that we have a free market in drugs and medicine. People talk about private practice, uh, drugs, and so on, as though this was really available. And lastly, I put lastly because it's uh, probably economically not that great, but it's very important ideologically, the escalating role of litigation in medical practice. And uh, uh, in, in listing this, I have in mind not only malpractice uh, litigation, some of which, of course, <coughs> is justified, but a great deal of it, like the verdict about the spilled coffee in McDonald's, <laughs> illustrates a mechanism which seems to me, I mean, again, I'm going to give you my answer to it, which seems to me so transparent. People uh, keep complaining about how irrational this is, but I don't think this is irrational at all. I mean, you know, I like this old uh, Shakespearean, uh, I think Shakespeare was a very good, quote, psychiatrist, he said there is method in madness. 
which is another way of saying it's not mad at all, if you can figure out what the method is. Now, what's the method in this large mer- awards, various awards? Well, it's perfectly sensible. It's Marxism. For, give, take from those who have and give it to those who don't. Except we, we call it uh, uh, tort litigation. <laughs> now, except for technical advances in medicine and the aging of the population, every one of the other factors is due to the government's involvement in health care. If the government was not involved in paying for CAT scans, and CAT scans would be like Lexuses, or expensive hotel rooms, or you know, Mediterranean vacations, and people who can pay for it would pay for it, and people who can't, can't. Now, maybe in the discussion period we can get back to, you know, well, what about, you know, should healthcare be really a, a market item? I'm not going to discuss it now. Uh, <clears throat> There are, uh, I have some uh, comments here on two other subjects that I will just go by fast. And there is one is that because of the fact that health care, health insurance has increasingly subscribed, uh, uh, def- uh, defrayed the expenses of the most trivial things, including medicines, you know, which may cost five or ten dollars, which people could pay for, just like pay for lottery tickets. But since even those are increasingly covered in health cares, another phenomenon has come into being which shows uh, sort of the hypocrisy within hypocrisy. And that is, again, I don't know how many of you notice this. But you know, why do we have prescription drugs? Well, the rationale is that these, many of the drugs, and this is all true, are chemically, biologically, very complicated products. And unless you're a physician, unless you know about pharmacology and so on, you really don't know what they do, so maybe you shouldn't just be able to go out and buy this, but go through an expert who will give this to you. Well, fine. Well, how do you explain the fact that all of a sudden, a prescription drug overnight becomes an over-the-counter drug? Well, why? Because of economics. Because over-the-counter, then you have to pay for it from your pocket. And the insurance company no no longer pays for it. So now there is an economic incentive for making all kinds of drugs, over-the-counter drugs. Just to give you a couple of examples, and many of these are really imbecilic in the sense of infantilizing in the extreme, in that many of these drugs are still prescription drugs if you get it in an adequate therapeutic dose. If you get it in a dose which is so small that you really have to take two 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 or three pills to get an effect. Best example is Advil. Advil is ibuprofen. Known as prescription, probably many of you have taken it. I've had a bad back. It's a wonderful drug. It's uh, it's called Motrin. Now, if you go to a doctor, he will give you Motrin, which comes 400 milligrams, 600 milligrams, and 800 milligram pills. Advil is 200 milligrams. That's probably too little. Now, if you take two Advil, then you've got a prescription strength Motrin. That's legal. Same thing with Benadryl. Benadryl is antihistamine. 25 milligrams you can buy over the counter. 50 milligrams is illegal. It's illegal. You have to get a prescription. There's a whole list of this now. And this is list is now being uh, increased all the time in order to get them out of the insurance scheme. Excuse me. Let me not lose my... Now, manage, the other thing I was going to talk about is managed competition, but I'm not going to talk about managed competition because that's patently an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no such thing. Okay, now let's t- let me turn to the two examples which I want to use in my presentation. The two big diseases which now illustrate uh, the problem of increasing healthcare costs and my argument about the government really being in an entirely new business, and I might as well point this out now, because this seems to be a very, very simple transformation, which again, uh, let me sort of uh, slice right through it. Whatever you think of the legitimacy of the state and the history of this debate from Hobbes and Locke on, it makes a lot of sense to think of the state as some kind of a necessary, if you like, necessary evil as this organization, this monopoly of power that has come into being by whatever fiction of consent or whatever, 
But historically, through some, it makes some sense to, to, to say that we are going to forego the idea of adjudicating wrongs and using coercion and power, and we're going to give this to the state to do this. To protect us from what? To protect us from enemies abroad, called, for which we have soldiers, and enemies abroad, enemies at home, called policemen. Well, it seems to me that in the last 30, 40 years, and now, with total abandon in the last 10, 15 years, today, with total abandon, the United States in particular, it's as if the government has said, we have a new contract. We will no longer protect you, especially from enemies at home. You cannot leave the hotel in New York at 10 o'clock and walk around. You cannot leave your home because it will probably be burglarized. You will be pickpocketed, you will be assaulted on the subway, you will be pushed under the subway, and we are not going to do anything about it because that's not our business. Our business is to protect you from yourself. <laughs> Therefore, we have to have depression screening because, God forbid, you might want to kill yourself. <laughs> Back to psychiatry. This is where psychiatry came in. Psychiatry is a system which came into being in order to protect people from being dangerous to themselves or others. Now you know that this is the key law in every modern society. It goes back to roughly 1700 in England. It has an interesting history. Now this was a way to get rid of unwanted people who committed no crimes. I mean, here is this middle-aged or elderly or a grandfather or your wife, let's say, or you want to go about your business, and she's depressed. She doesn't feed the babies. Uh, she doesn't take care of herself. She becomes an embarrassment. But here you are at 1720, an English nobleman. How do you get rid of her? There's no divorce. Murder is illegal. This was a problem that Macbeth had. What is he going to do? Remember Macbeth? He calls for the doctor. What's he going to do with Lady Macbeth? I mean, here he murders his way to the pinnacle of power. He wants to enjoy himself. I always think of Macbeth as Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> Lady, <laughs> Lady Bird. <laughs> but, so what is he going to do? So he calls the doctor. And the doctor says, no, this is not a business for the doctor. It's a business for the cleric. And wh what does Shakespeare say is the correct treatment for depression? Suicide. Why? Because she's depressed, because she's evil. Now this is all gone. Now we have to protect you from yourself. This started with psychiatry. And psychiatry, mind you, again, be clear about this. Psychiatry was very important. It still is important. Psychiatry began, as I see it, as a sewer of medicine. This is how doctors got rid of troublesome patients. Now it's a sewer of society. What do you think will happen to this gentleman who shot at the White House this afternoon? Do you have any doubt that he will be seen by a psychiatrist in the next 48 hours? <laughs> now what for? Isn't it prima facie a crime to go around and shoot at the White House? Pennsylvania? What do you want to examine for? What are you looking for? His mental state? What does that mean? What mental state? Right? First, the guys will come up with something. Why? To show to the American people that no, quote, sane American would want to shoot at the White House. God forbid. Who wants to do that? <laughs> and secondly, probably, to be able to dispose of him for longer than the law would permit. Because I don't know what the legal penalty for this thing is, but whatever it is, he's going to be in a mental hospital longer than otherwise. See, when is Hinckley going to get out? Never. In a pine box. They're waiting for him to be cured. This is all legal. This is all, not more than legal, this is the ACLU. Is a, everybody's forces, except libertarians. And even libertarians, you know, this is a very hard not to, not to crack, you know, this, what do you do with crazy people? And I'll be hap happy to have some, some discussion about this. But let, now let's turn to, that's why I thought I would t take two examples of, quotes craziness, which are perfectly normal, namely eating too much and smoking. Now let me give you a couple of quotes, uh, uh, all from very recent. As you know, this has gone on for a long time too now, several decades. But now it's sort of getting a, a greater steam is building up behind this. Treating overweight as a disease, <coughs> a group of investigators, and notice that this is now a legitimate subject for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. They are now studying eating too much. They don't call it that, of course. Overweight, I'm quoting from their report from July 94. 
overweight is increasing in U.S. adults and continues to be a public health dilemma. Now, read, listen carefully, because there are internal contradictions here that I don't want to belabor. It's a public health dilemma for which no efficacious, practical, and long-lasting preventive or therapeutic solution has yet been identified. <laughs> Please keep that in mind, because of what follows immediately. Overweight, they repeat it, overweight is a condition known to be resistant to intervention. Nevertheless, next sentence, no pause. Nevertheless, federal health authorities have targeted the reduction in the, pre, in the prevalence of overweight as a national health objective to be achieved by the year 2000. End of quote. <laughs> I have all this referenced. Now, picking up the theme, the New York Times, needless to say, gets immediately on this bandwagon. And uh, wringing its hand, it reports that the proportion of adult population considered overweight defined as being 20% or more over his or her desirable weight, increased from 25% to 33% in one decade. So naturally, they go around and ask people what they think about this. A professor of medicine, whom I won't identify at Columbia University, stated, quotes, the proportion of the population that is obese is incredible. If this was about tuberculosis, it could be called an epidemic. The problem with obesity is that once you have it, it is very difficult to treat." End of quote. <laughs> A Harvard University professor, not to be outdone, has numbers for it. He has figured out that obesity costs the nation exactly 68.8 billion. No, no cents are mentioned. <laughs> now, how can obesity cost anybody anything is beyond, is beyond me, but this is the New English. The government is not doing enough, stated Philip Lee, Assistant Secretary of Health. Finally, one more expert on obesity weighed in, urging, quotes, a President's Council on Diet and Health to be established. The Democratic Congressman rushed from New York, promised to introduce legislation to create such a council. Now, notice that although the experts agree that there is no treatment for it, it must be treated. And compare this to the fact that the FDA won't put a drug on the market, even if it's used for 20 years in Europe, and even though the customers are willing to take it and take a risk, because they have not proved it yet that it's safe and efficacious. It's, unless you can prove that a drug treats a particular disease, the FBA will not license it for sale in the US. So in that case, they are over strict. In this case of, of obesity, it's untreatable, according to their own expert, but by Bali, it's a government job to treat it. Now, this, of course, is all nothing compared to smoking. And I have several quotes here, some of, most of which I will probably not bore you with. But uh, the war on cigarettes has now escalated to such a point that any, uh, several commentators have, in the last couple of years, compared the tactic to Nazi and communist tactics. And one of the, most, uh, one of the ones that I like the best, and I will quote this, is a comment that Florence King uh, wrote, uh, who I think, in my opinion, is probably the best uh, humorist now uh, in this country, best satirist, uh, writing in the National Review. Now, without mentioning where she got this from, and I suppose most of you, all of you will recognize it, let me just uh, read to you what she wrote. <coughs> Quotes. When they came for the smokers, I kept silent because I don't smoke. When they came for the meat eaters, I kept silent because I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> when they came for the gun owners, I kept silent because I'm a pacifist. When they came for the drivers, I kept silent because I'm a bicyclist. They never did come for me. I am still here because there is nobody left in the secret police except sissies with rickets. <laughs> <laughs> now, th this, is a, this is a parody on the not at all funny lines attributed, I, I understand that this is not, no one really knows whether he said that, but Pastor Martin Niemöller uh, said this about <coughs> how the Nazis came for the communists and Jews and so on, and when they came for him there was no one to speak of. Now the same, I won't read this to you, probably some of you have seen it, perhaps you didn't notice it, the R.G. Reynolds company has been running full page ads in the Times with several panels showing this, that they came for cigarettes, they came for this, and alcohol, what will be next? Cigarettes tomorrow. Sort of this civil libertarian. Now, you see, none of these people said this about marijuana or, or opium or all the other drugs. <coughs> <coughs> now, 
Now, Vladimir Bukowski, this won't read either, he actually compared it to communist tactics, and he suggested, and he was wondering who won the Cold War, who won the Cold War, and whether this isn't Cold War, Cold War number two, we are living through today, with a new breed of coercive utopians striving to alter our culture, etc. Now, what does all this mean? My reading of this is that this is all a part of what Joe Sobran was telling us at lunchtime with the following um, footnote, if you like, or, or appendix to it. There's what has changed in the Constitution? Why, why is this totally different approach? And I'm going to put this to you extremely simply, but sometimes things are very simple. The moral, political, religious, if you like, and I'm not a religious person, so I don't want to parade on their false premises, but uh, that doesn't mean I can't share certain religious traditions or values, had a basic premise which it never occurred to them to question. And that is that they are dealing with other adults, that is, they, the politicians, who were there, so to speak, existential equal, who were equal before God, who were responsible moral agents. Now, it never occurs to anyone now in the intelligentsia, in this medically, psychologically sophisticated age, that anybody who does anything wrong is a moral agent. Only normal people are moral agents. Abnormal people have something wrong with them. They have child abuse, alcoholic fathers, uh, uh, sex abuse, uh, they have a neurosis, they have multiple personality, they are schizophrenic, they are depressed, and so on. They are not moral agents, and they will only be moral agents after we fix them, and we have to first turn them into moral agents. So they, th and this explains why virtually all the ads, all the rhetoric, uh, Mrs. Reagan uh, uh, exemplified this is a war on drugs. She all, all the time talked about keeping drugs from kids. Well, who wants to hear about kids? Since why do politicians talk about kids? Who is keeping kids from Clorox and toilet cleaners and whatnot? <laughs> and knives. And we're not talking about kids. Kids are a problem for parents. We are talking about what adults can do. But there are no adults except the politicians and their psychiatric agents. This is the light motif. And Hillary and Tipper Gore embodies this. And the fact, and I know that I am putting my, my foot in my mouth, the fact that these two people are women is not accidental, because women are the nurturing, caring ones, not the punishing ones. We don't punish anymore. That was Carl Menninger's famous book, The Crime of Punishment. Punishment is a crime. Crime is not a crime. That was a bestseller. You are laughing. That is now, look at DSM-4. Look at the American Psychiatric Association. Why would criminals be immediately asked to have psychiatric exams? If the presumption was there is something wrong with them or else they wouldn't have done what they have done. There is no evil. Now at the risk of putting my foot further in, in my mouth, let me show you how I see this transformation in, so to speak, religious terms. It seems to be our very concept of God and religion has become debauched. And I apologize if I offend anyone, I apologize even more if the point I make is not as good as I think it is. <laughs> now it's, it seems to me that a couple of hundred years ago, and it doesn't matter whether it's a hundred years or two hundred years, not that long ago, let's assume that there was some natural calamity like some sudden flood or avalanche in the, in the Alps which wipes out a little village. Let's say 60 people perish in this mudslide and water and whatnot, <laughs> and three survive. Now, in the old days, I think a lot of people would have gone to church and entertained the idea that they ought to thank uh, God for saving these three people and that this is a very important uh, event, but that maybe there was some element of divine punishment in killing the other 60. Maybe, maybe they were sinners. Maybe there was something wrong with them. This is now blasphemy. Now if something like this happens, everybody inside the television cameras goes and thanks God for saving the three people. The idea that the 60 died is not mentioned. Like in this case, obviously, you can't sue anybody, except maybe you can sue the, some ski lift operator if, it's, if, if he owns a hill. But that's not mentioned. 
what I'm getting at is that we now think of God as only doing good things, exactly like quotes and earths. If they do bad things, they don't exist. And this is reflected in the kind of Gallup polls which ask people, do you believe in God? And 95% is yes. Do you believe in heaven? 98% is yes. Do you believe in hell? 2%. <laughs> Now, it seems to me that this all makes sense, that we only have normal people, and then we have insanity, which, we have, which we're going to cure. But we no longer have human beings. I mean, this uh, Auden has also picked up. So, so among other things, then, what we have, <coughs> since obviously people do bad things, what we have, although we no longer use this word, why do, do people bad things? And in old-fashioned terminology, and this term is still usable, because we have temptations. But we don't use that term anymore. These people have temptations to gamble, to eat too much, to drink, I mean, you know, uh, gl gluttony, uh, fornication, and so we don't use these terms now. We have disease terms now, and therefore part of the government's job is to regulate the temptations and to protect you from being tempted, to it, don't be tempted by heroin, you can't get it. If you get it, we'll put you in jail for a long time. We'll tell you what to be tempted by, lottery. Now this is extremely interesting <laughs> because, this is extremely interesting because when I came to this, when I came to this country, th thank God, before the war, gambling was a far worse moral and political thing than drugs. You could get, you could get any prescription, you could get all the barbiturates you wanted as a lay person. If you knew the druggist, if you knew what you were doing, and you paid for it. Nobody worried about this. In other words, prescription laws were permissive rather than, there was no triplicate prescription. Nobody was watching the doctors, waiting to put them in jail. So it was a totally different atmosphere. There was no, but gambling, my God, that was a terrible thing. Now gambling is sponsored by the government, hand in hand with a new disease. Pathological gambling. <laughs> well, you know what that is. Pathological gambling is when you lose. <laughs> <It's a laughs> now, now, I have one other, apropos of temptation, what you shouldn't be tempted by, one other delicious quote here, from by a, very recently by a psychiatrist, naturally, Roland Griffith, a professor at Johns Hopkins, not far from here who said in the New York Times, explaining uh, these various drugs, quotes, people think of chocolate and sodas as food, but a case can be made that these are vehicles for drug self-administration. Now notice the very word drug self-administration and the other um, English word, perfectly nice English word, self-medication, is now synonymous with doing something bad. Now you know what masturbation used to be called in the good old days. Self-abuse. <laughs> we don't have self-abuse, we have drug abuse. This is a very libertarian theme. There is only one sin in a libertarian philosophy, in my, as I can see it. And that's in an anti-libertarian philosophy, that is to say. And that's autonomy. If you take care of yourself, if you control yourself, then you are no good Nick. Because then you don't need the great leader, the protector. See, most of us don't need the FDA to protect us from heroin. We wouldn't be using heroin. That's true for most Americans. So you only need these things if you admit that you can't control yourself. So we are all back to Alcoholics Anonymous and 12 steps. The entire country, in effect, is supposed to say, as soon as it reaches 18, dear president, dear, dear country, I can't control myself. Please control me. Now, again, Winston Auden has satirized this particular social attitude <clears throat> in the following words. This is lovely. He is now talking about the caretakers. Quotes, we are all here on earth to help others. What on earth the others are here for, I don't know. Well, believe it or not, I am, I am finished. I have a concluding paragraph which I am going to read to you. We have been traveling down 
the road to what I call therapeutic serfdom, to take off from Hayek, the therapeutic state. We have been traveling down the road to therapeutic serfdom for a long time, really, in a way from 1906, from the Food and Drug Law uh, enactment, perhaps for too long to reverse course, assuming that there is popular desire to do so, for which there is not the slightest sign. Liberty, said Judge Learn at hand, lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. No constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help." End of quote. I think we must seriously consider the possibility that liberty has, in fact, died in the hearts of a very large majority of American men and women. And I venture to say that if that diagnosis is correct, the autopsy will show that it died by overdosing on therapy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, it's only 9.40, so <laughs> uh, I'll be happy to entertain any questions on anything that I know anything about. So if you want to ask anything more psychiatric, uh, feel free to do so, but you don't have to. Uh, no, you don't need this. Please, sir. Is it what it is? A tapeworm. Oh. Supposedly that was one of the reasons we got the Food and Drug Administration. It's a good story. <laughs> well, uh, it's, uh, thank you. I like that. I mean, diseases is cures. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, could you comment on the uh, the the work that people are doing in terms of trying to isolate DNA and other types of things like that to uh, to predict people's predilection towards certain behaviors such as drug abuse and alcohol abuse? I don't know where to begin uh, to answer that question because uh, to my mind the uh, enterprise is so patently uh, fallacious. Again, one doesn't have to invent the wheel, it's already been invented. The way you identify the etiology or cause of a disease is by you first identifying the disease. In other words, it has to be something, somebody has edema in the legs, let's say, like from heart failure or you know, possibly some stasis for some post-surgical reason. Well, then you have, this person has too much water in the legs. And you want to find out why. This is a physiologic, physical, observable phenomenon. Drug abuse is a, de is a name for a behavior. Now, by definition, drug abuse is not the kind of thing, although there may be exceptions to this in the case of alcohol or some other things, but by and large, historically, drug abuse conforms to the Mark Twain formula, quotes, nothing so much changed needs changing as other people's habits. <coughs> well, what is drug abuse? Drug abuse is what somebody else does. Or how do you, in other words, you can, you can study the, the, the genetics or the biology of why tulips are black or white or red, but you can't study why, why they are beautiful. It's a judgment. There's no genetics of why tulips are beautiful. Now, drug abuse is a judgment. What's drug abuse? Are, are you with me? So I don't know what it is that these people are studying. Now that some people may be, for temperamental, personal, biological reasons, may be more inclined to drink, let's say, alcohol than other people, 
That's possible. I mean, that's, there are all kinds of anthropological, historical uh, comments about that. Maybe the Irish are more, more inclined than Jews, although that doesn't seem to hold up with acculturation and whatnot, with cultural change. But let's assume that's the case. From a social policy point of view, that would only mean that people of Irish descent would have to exercise more self-control because they are more interested in it. But it's no different than some, some bibliophile is more interested in reading than in not reading than somebody who is illiterate. You, you see my point? I draw an absolutely impenetrable wall between behavior and disease. Disease as a happening. Now this is not, this doesn't completely hold up. Because there are some diseases which are more functional. But this is a very, very important thing to keep in mind. Behavior is behavior. I'm not denying the existence of behavior. Schizophrenia, paranoia, depression, and so on. Phobia, this exists. But it's a names for behavior. Actually, in my very first book, I compare abnormal behavior to something which you can hear demonstrated right here in front of your eyes. Speaking with an accent. <laughs> it's an abnormal behavior. Who is responsible for it? I, mean, I am. I don't have to speak. I can shut up. <laughs> I could have spent my time taking voice lessons instead of writing books. I could go back to Hungary. Right? So who is responsible for this? I can claim child abuse. My parents taught me Hungarian. <laughs> this, is a, this is a habit. A, a, a habit pattern, just as identifiable as alcoholism or paranoia. Now, a paranoid person thinks that people are after him. Very often people are, sometimes they are not. <laughs> so, so what? What's next? It's a constitutional right. You have a right to be paranoid. You have a right to be schizophrenic. See, you cannot understand any of these things. This is, to my mind, that's why I, you know, I think I was interested in libertarianism before I knew how to read and write, because it seems to me the issue is freedom. The issue is freedom from being coerced by physicians. Now, there are, in a civilized society, modern society, nobody can coerce you except policemen, judges, legislators, and doctors. Phys psychiatrists, not, not ordinary doctors. You can go to a dermatologist with no matter what, and you can be sure that you can leave the office. You cannot go to a psychiatrist and be sure you can leave the office. <laughs> and you certainly can't go into a psychiatric hospital where the door only swings one way. Now you're all laughing, but this is, a, this is a phenomenon which has not been taken seriously and which I am convinced will destroy Western countries. Because this is an irres... Nobody can be in favor of craziness, of madness, or, he, or illness. So you people say, well, you are in favor of people being ill? How, how can you be in favor of that? Untreated illness? People say, SARS wants to deprive mental patients of disease. I already indicated there is no connection between disease and treatment. Treatment is something you have because you want it and pay for it. Most doctors treat non-existent diseases. Yes, sir. I'm involved in two industries that are licensed, and in both cases, the licensing boards are controlled by the industry. Uh, could you tell me about the AMA and their part in what you've been talking about? Well, I didn't understand the first part of you. I can tell you something about the AMA, probably nothing that you don't know already. But I didn't understand the first half of the question about you are involved with licensing. Can you elaborate on that, or is it not, not important? I, I, I was saying that my experience is that the licensing boards are controlled by the people and the licensing boards are controlled by the industry. Yes. And the box is starting to You know what? From a purely technical point of view, who else should be controlling it? In other words, from a purely technological point of view, I would not be that opposed, I'm not particularly opposed to doctors being in charge of determining what is correct medical practice. Who else should determine it? Politicians or, or, or you know, stockbrokers or electrical engineers? There's nothing wrong with that. The question is why should they have any political power? Uh, the American Medical Association is simply just another labor union. Uh, that has swung with, uh, uh, you know, when I went to medical school, there was no greater crime than group practice. I mean, even places like the Mayo Clinic were looked at as scans because the idea was that anything other than a direct contract between a patient and a doctor and confidential personal relationship between those two, essentially a free market relationship, anything else was unethical. 
Now, of course, this was built on top of the fact that already they enjoyed licensure and the special privileges of excluding non-doctors, chiropractors, and so on, the whole, this whole competitive thing. Again, I don't know what to say about this except to read all of these things as we read uh, the stock market or as we read economic reports or, or the symptoms of, uh, of our own bodies. The fact is that, and this is where libertarianism, uh, libertarians should keep this in mind, that freedom, autonomy, the drive for freedom is only one of the things that people want. Now, those of us in this room put this particularly high, but there are all kinds of other values that people rank very high, often much more highly than liberty, of which health is very high, security, dependence on authority. Now, most people like this idea that they can look in the yellow pages and every doctor is every other doctor, that these are fungible enti entities, that you don't have to find out who this doctor is and how good he is. So this phenomenon, this licensure, caters to that. And I don't think this is imposed on the people. I think this, is, this satisfies a, a human want. Uh, it seems to me, and perhaps I didn't dwell on that enough, uh, that really the underlying problem is that there are not enough adults who feel like adults, that people are infantile, most people, and want to be treated as children, and this, this is the result of it. And you see, I mean, people weeping when Kennedy dies or Roosevelt dies as though they lost their father. I mean, they should have been happy. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean we call them lawmakers. I mean, the implication is the more laws they make, the better, and so on. But this is, but they take care of you. I mean, if uh, it's, it's, you know, the, the twain shall never meet. I mean, the question is, how do you look at these people? Somebody that you need to take care of you or somebody who's bothering you? Now, most people look upon doctors in the AMA and they're going to protect them from quacks. The fact that they are licensing quacks, that the whole thing is somehow, the distinction between quackery and real medicine is best known in hindsight. You know, 50 years later, you can decide what was good medicine. Doctor, is there, sure. is there anything that you've noted in uh, your members of the profession that makes you optimistic either in the short term or the long term? Well, uh, I am no Pollyanna, but I'm not totally pessimistic in the sense that uh, the march of that science, civilization, knowledge, and so on are cumulative, are progressive. We know more and more all the time, and that nothing can do any, anything about this. This is beyond any, this is, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. You know, just as, as soon as a hydrogen bomb was exploded, you know how, the, I, mean, I understand the story of the hydrogen bomb, the Russian one, is that as soon as Teller managed to make one here and it was exploded, the Russians could tell from the fallout how it was made. Boom, so they didn't have to really spy for it, although that, that may help. So, knowledge is cumulative and to the extent to which we have more knowledge and more technological progress, doctors will be able to more and more for you no matter what. Now, I am all, not all that pessimistic either that there, that there will be, there is only so far you can push people. I think the intractability of the war on drugs, the very fact that uh, we are engaged in this quest of building more and more prisons and so on, and that this is constantly in the news, and the polarization between blacks and whites that this has created, I think all of this may act as a corrective. After all, we are creating a race war with the war on drugs. Now, this is how we saw, this is how we will reap. Now, what the end of that will be, again, that may be a catastrophe or it may be something relatively corrective, that we will see that this is something which was a stupid thing to do. Uh, this is a tiger that's very hard to dismount. It's a very, very hard to dismount. It seems to me that until we distinguish between two very simple English words, and I, this would be relatively easy to do between, or three English words, two of which are synonymous or could be synonymous. The two good ones are cure and care. Okay? Now the other one is coercion. Now how these can be coupled is the problem. And we know now that the medical profession, as it has become more and more statized, is more and more in the business. It's more and more like psychiatry. Now psychiatry has always been, people understood that, and this is also very difficult to talk about. Excuse me for taking a little longer to answer this question. See, when I grew up, things were relatively simpler, and unless you know the history of this, again, you'll be confused. 
Even when I grew up in Hungary, uh, 1920s, 1930s, it, it was very, very clear that psychiatry was essentially a, like, a, like a jail function, that there were blue-coated policemen and white-coated policemen, and there were prisons in which you were locked up by the law, and there were medical prisons, psychiatric prisons, in which you were locked up by mad doctors. Now, this is a history. You realize that long before there was psychiatry, there were mental hospitals. Psychiatry doesn't start like medicine. The beginning of psychiatry is the beginning of mental hospitals. Then there had to be a rationalization for why people are in there. And for that, mental illness was created. That, in a nutshell, is the history of psychiatry. So this was psychiatry. Okay. Now, up until the Freudian revolution, and this is very interesting, civil rights and so on, I don't know if you realize that there was no such thing as a Jewish psychiatrist. Well, think of the great psychiatrist. Pinel, Esquirol, Kreppelin, Bloiler, Wagner Jaure. How come there were no Jewish psychiatrists? Just like there were no Jewish generals. In Europe, a Jew could not become a state hospital director, which was what a psychiatrist was. These were state hospitals. Look at the terminology. This was a statist operation. Just like you couldn't become a general in the army. So then comes Freud, who is now described as a psychiatrist. Now, Freud was all kinds of things. He was never a psychiatrist. He never worked in a mental hospital. He never had a single patient who didn't want to be his patient. Psychoanalysis originally was what it would now might be called anti-psychiatry. Psychoanalysis was a contract between two people, one of whom paid the other for a service. And this is how the voluntary part of what we now call psychiatry came in. We have two kinds of psychiatry, voluntary and involuntary, which are in exactly the same relation to one another as a prosecuting attorney and a defense attorney. Except this is now homogenized so that when you are in trouble out there, let's assume you are indicted as a, for a crime, you, don't, you think you are going to somebody who will help you, but you are going to a prosecuting attorney because they are not identified as which is which. And in fact, all psychiatrists are supposed to be now agents of the state by law. <laughs> So this has become an extremely intractable problem. But this is how it started. That this is entirely different. To some extent, this function of just talking to people has now been taken over by social workers and psychologists. But because of the legal understructure of this, this has now become very confused. And the entire mental health industry, as I see it, is essentially a statist operation. And in point of fact, to put it very simply, and you don't have to know anything about this except what you already know. I dare say, if every last cent paid by the federal and state governments for mental health were withdrawn tomorrow morning, psychiatry, psychology, and social work as we know it would disappear from the face of America. Thank you.